Welcome back to Talking Foreign Affairs with Ardell Carter, the show that connects you directly with heads of state. In this episode, I'm speaking one-on-one with Dr. Mahathir Mohamad, former Malaysian Prime Minister, who also holds the distinct title of the longest ever serving Prime Minister in Southeast Asia. At the age of 93, he made a politi- remarkable political comeback when he was re-elected as Prime Minister in 2018. Having first held the position from 1981 to 2003, and with a wealth of political experience, he oversaw the country's transition to an industrialized nation and carved out Malaysia's proactive global approach. Today, Dr. Mahathir will share his frank reflections on his foreign policy choices and thoughts on the future of the region. Dr. Mahathir, thank you so much for joining us on Talking Foreign Affairs. You're welcome. So, Dr. Mahathir, I want to go back to the start of your second stint as Prime Minister in 2018. Uh, You came into power after 15 years, which included nine years of former Prime Minister Najib Razak. What was the transition like from the previous government? Also, what was your vision after this transition for Malaysia's role in the world? Well, when I stepped down, the party that formed the government was still strong. And the succeeding uh, prime ministers who were from the same party. I thought that they would carry out the objectives of the party. But unfortunately, during Najib's time, he deviated completely from the objectives of the party. He stressed uh, having a lot of money to buy support. And he, he since he did not, did not have the money, he borrowed huge sums of money. And then he ex- uh, misappropriated the, the money. He took the money to use for political uh, reason, for to get gain support for himself. So at that stage, I felt that he has taken the party uh, a, taken a wrong direction for the party. I thought that I could not support the party anymore, that I have to find out how I can put an end to Najib as the Prime Minister, although he was from my party. So that was why uh, in 19... In 19... Uh, in 2018, I decided to come back and contest, and we won, and Najib was overthrown. So when you won the election in 2018, what was your vision for Malaysia's role in the world? I wanted to restore Malaysia to the, uh, to the uh, stage of uh, development that it had achieved uh, during 20 years I was Prime Minister. I wanted to bring back that kind of uh, country, uh, which was at one time described as an Asian tiger. So that was my objective. And to do that, I had to take uh, many different actions to rid the country of people who abused their power. So looking at that last term, you cancelled various investment projects from China and Malaysia. Could you explain a bit more about this? Well, they were not actually cancelled. What we found was that the terms of the contract was not in favour of Malaysia. We were losing a lot of money. Uh, They were uh, uh, giving the contracts to Chinese companies, to Chinese workers, to Chinese contractors. So Malaysia got nothing. So I thought that we should renegotiate the terms of the contract. So it wasn't actually cancelled. We wanted to re to change the terms of the contract. And this we were uh, successful because the Chinese accepted that uh, the terms uh, favoured them more than us. Certainly. And... 
On that note, you've also warned in various speeches during your time in office about a new form of neocolonialism. Uh, can you just explain a bit more about this? Well, uh, we became independent, but uh, we found that although we were independent, there were things that uh, we had to uh, get, get the support of the developed countries, particularly mm. in the area of economics. To grow the country, we need uh, to trade, we need to have good relations with many countries. And of course, in order to uh, attract them to invest in Malaysia, we have to give them certain privileges. And it amounts to them still dictating uh, certain terms to us. That was why it was called new colonialism, mm. but it was not me, it was President Sukarno of Indonesia who yeah. coined the word new colonialism. Just touching upon that, uh, looking back now, do you still have the same concerns on the Belgian Road Initiative? <clears throat> Well, I am still very much concerned because now uh, Malaysia has a different government and this government uh, has got different ideas. At the same time, uh, the problems of the country has uh, expanded into economics, politics, social, and the present government is unable to handle many of the crises. So we need to... Uh, we need actually to have good um, leaders who focus on the country's development, not on their personal gain. So I want to touch a bit more about this. In going back to your first term, you spearheaded the establishment of the D8 organization. What was your vision for this? Well, actually, the idea of D8 was... Um, mooted by the Prime Minister of Turkey, Erbakan, at that time. And of course, we supported the idea. We were keen to get these D8 eight countries to come together, to treat with each other, to help each other develop. And uh, they have great potential. At the time, most of these countries were exploited by... Uh, Western countries, Western countries saw the opportunities, but uh, many of the Eastern countries uh, did not uh, focus on these countries. We thought that it was time for us to focus on these eight countries, bring them together, increase the trade between them, and generally help each other. A very interesting point about how an action you took a couple of decades ago is still having an impact today. Something else I'm quite keen for you to enlighten our young audience about is your leadership in the role of the non-aligned movement. So many of our listeners wouldn't have actually been around when that happened. Can you just explain to our, to our, to our viewers a, the actions you took in the non-aligned movement and trying playing a role in leadership there? What benefits does it have those countries that we are seeing today? Well, in the Second World War, the uh, Russian and the Western Allies worked together and defeated Germany. Mm. Now, we thought that that will mean that there will be less uh, less uh, antagonism between, between them. But the moment uh, the Western countries uh, defeated Germany, they decided that Russia would be their next uh, enemy. Mm. So because of that, the world becomes divided into two. Those who are with the West Western countries and those who are supportive of Russia. So as a result, uh, the Western countries set up NATO, uh, a defense organization. And the Russian, on the other hand, uh, had a pact called the Warsaw Pact. So there is confrontation between these two groups of countries. And this was not healthy. Uh, it uh, affects the economic development of many um, uh, developing countries. So we thought 
we we found that the idea of a third force that is neither east nor west would be very useful to balance the antagonism between the two uh, blocks. And that is why Malaysia support the idea of non-aligned movement. We are not aligned to the east, we are not aligned to the west. We stand on our own, we act on the basis of what we consider to be the right moves. So fast forward today, we're seeing now a new form of uh, battle for uh, regional dominance, especially in this part of the region between the US and China. Can we take that principle of the non-aligned movement, which you supported back then, and apply it now, given that we're seeing a lot of countries having to decide either between U.S. bases or Chinese bases? Well, uh, America seems to think that uh, the whole world should accept the leadership of America, even in areas where they have actually no uh, special interests. But they will, did not like the idea that China would become a very powerful country, challenging them. So very early on, they tried to block China. Uh, and China uh, this, did not go to the West. China uh, remained in the East, in South, South China Sea. And the Americans uh, uh, think that the South China Sea should not be dominated by China. And in order to, to, to do that, the Americans confronted China and tried to get other countries to confront China. And so again, there is division and antagonism between two different groups. The Malaysia does not want to join either China no. All, uh, all America, we want to be friends of all countries. So because of that, we find that the American attitude of sending warships and even uh, politicians to the South China Sea, to Taiwan, is not going to achieve anything yep. except to increase tension. And indeed, when the speaker... Uh, of the uh, um, Congress in America visited Taiwan, tension increased, and now we see them confronting each other because when the Taiwan uh, the takes action to strengthen its military capability, China does the same, so the tension increases. And this uh, may result in some accidents taking place, and that may lead to uh, war. And that is not good for Malaysia. So just on that note, you talk about Malaysia trying to play a balancing role and not taking sides. And as this interview is being recorded, the US Congress has just passed a uh, significant amount of aid to Taiwan. When you were prime minister, how did you go about getting that balance and dealing with the Taiwan situation? Well, we, we think it is a bad thing to, for the U.S. to uh, provoke China by supporting Taiwan is very bad. For example, the relationship between Taiwan and China, China was uh, not bad. There, there is no actual military action against each other. Uh, China made use of Taiwan uh, to gain access to Western technology, and Taiwan invests in China because of the huge market that China uh, presents. So the relation was uh, not not to say very friendly, but it's uh, it's okay. But then America decided to send uh, this uh, speaker of the uh, of the Congress. Kevin two time. And that acts as a provocation. The result is that China increases its uh, capacity to fight. And of course, 
uh, America advised uh, Taiwan that they must have, they must strengthen their defense capability. How do they strengthen it? By buying American uh, weapons. So America gains, by this visit, America gains in terms of promoting the sales of their very sophisticated and very expensive weapons. And tension has grown between China and Taiwan uh, because of this action, provocative action by America. So you speak about the role of the US, but looking at the role of Malaysia, many people aren't aware of the instrumental role <clears throat> Malaysia has played in the region. For example, uh, um, having to mediate the Southern Philippines peace process. Can you just share a bit more about this and what benefits does it bring to Malaysia being a mediator in these regional issues? When the countries of Southeast Asia gain independence, hmm. they confronted each other. They carried on their old uh, antagonism towards each other. In fact, there were even a uh, uh, minor war between Indonesia and Malaysia. And this is very damaging. It doesn't help with the development of the countries. But fortunately, the leaders of five countries of Southeast Asia decided to get together and set up a regional organization, eventually called ASEAN. Hmm. These five countries decided that they should meet every year. The leaders of these countries should meet every year and discuss the problems between them. Since then, there has been no confrontation, no more wars, no more uh, irritation uh, with each other. And this uh, group has grown to include all the countries of Southeast Asia. One of the achievements of ASEAN is that it has uh, rejected confrontation mm. and military action in favor of uh, regular meetings between the leaders of the 10 countries. And this has proven that it is possible for neighbors, although they were strangers before, to form a grouping that uh, eliminates the need for confrontation and wars. So looking at the future of ASEAN, do you think there's potential to play a larger and a more effective role in the future? Well, I should hope that the ASEAN model is uh, copied by other groupings. The, what is the ASEAN model? We decided that uh, there is no benefit from confrontation and from military action, but we can resolve problems through discussion, through meetings, regular meetings between the countries, between the leaders of the countries. I think other groupings uh, did, did not have the arrangement whereby the leaders regularly meet mm. in order to overcome problems between them. So ASEAN provides a good model for the rest of the world. Just one final question on regional dynamics before we go into submitted questions in by our listeners. This is going back to the role of China in the region and a bit more closer to home where we are here in Australia. Uh, so on that note, we have seen military responses here in the Asia Pacific, uh, including here in Australia with AUKUS and a missile agreement announced recently with, between Japan, Australia and the US in response to perceived Chinese aggression in the region. Well, what are your thoughts on this? Well, China has always been a big, a powerful nation in the past. Uh, it dominates the whole of uh, the, the Asian region. But China did not conquer countries. But the West has got different ideas. When they come in contact, came in contact with Eastern countries, their idea was to uh, take over these Eastern countries to colonize them. So they want to have direct uh, control over the countries of the region. And of course, uh, 
they see China as a, being an obstacle to their idea about colonization. And when they see China growing and developing very fast, they felt that China too might want to confront them to try and mm. regain territories. But so far, China has not done that. But of course, China has a right to defend itself. And if it is a military power, China has to develop good military capability to defend China. And this shows that China has actually the possibility of becoming the world number one country, mm. both economically and also politically. But this is, of course, something that the U.S. Uh, is against. The U.S. wants to be the dominant country in the world. And because of that, the U.S. It tries to block China, mm -hmm. sanctions and things like that, to prevent China from growing and becoming number one country in the world. And this will continue because the U.S. Uh, sees uh, solutions only through confrontation and through wars. But I think China doesn't want war. China wants to grow itself by trade and by having mm -hmm. a relation with the world. Thank you for that perspective. It's certainly not the perspective we hear in this part of the world. It's always good to hear other opinions from other regions. Uh, we're now moving on to the section where we had some submitted in questions. And the theme of this is just general leadership and you having you reflecting on your time as prime minister. The first question is, who is a head of state you had to deal with during your time as prime minister that you most admired for their leadership and why? Well, uh, we are in Southeast Asia. The most important thing is to see that the region is peaceful and is able to grow and develop. So uh, the heads of state that is that uh, is important was important to us were the leaders of the ASEAN countries, particularly Indonesia, because of the ASEAN countries, Indonesia is the biggest country, with now with a population of over two hundred million. So we have to have good relation with Indonesia, but also with the other countries. When there are problems, we try to resolve problems through discussions, through negotiation, not through confrontation or through threats of uh, military action. And that makes us makes the leaders of ASEAN countries uh, important to us because we want their support for uh, a region that is going to be peaceful and developing to catch up with the developed countries. So was there a specific leader or head of state that you admired for their leadership skills and something you learned from them? Well, at that time, of course, uh, um, I looked to the leaders in the ASEAN countries. And I also have to take note of the leaders in the rest of the world. And uh, for that, uh, we find that there were many uh, prominent leaders, uh, but many of them are aggressive. Uh, they, they keep on building military capability as if they are going to war. And when you prepare for war, you get war. The idea that to have peace, prepare for war is nonsense. And you prepare for war, eventually there will be an outbreak. And yeah. already we are seeing this uh, happening in Europe. Uh, they form NATO, prepared for war. NATO is actually a military uh, organization. And then uh, the Russian set up a Warsaw Pact. And now we have a war between Russia and NATO basically through this war against Ukraine. So Europe, historically, Europe is where wars start. Mm. 
world war start with Europe and their quarrel and then spread throughout the world. The First World War and the Second World War all started in Europe. And they dragged other countries into the war and it became world wars. And the next question we've got is, do you think democracy is an appropriate model for every single country in the world? Or is it natural that some countries are better off without democracy? No, there is a feeling that if you are democratic, everything will be fine. No, it's not so. Yes, in a democracy, the people has a right to choose the government. But sometimes there will be manipulation. There will be people of bad character who make use of this vote, buying votes, etc., corruption, and they win the support of the people. They form governments which are not good governments. Now, we have seen um, uh, democracies uh, result in having governments that exploit their, uh, their power, that actually um, well, get involved in corruption, in stealing money, etc. So, what, what if democracy is only workable if there are limit? We are limited to two parties. If we have many parties, then none of the parties will have sufficient uh, majority to form the government. So, at the end of an election, there will be a hung parliament. We can't have the parliament because nobody has won the election. So this may uh, cause them to, to have another run of election between the, the, the best performers. Or we find sometimes the losing parties banded together to, uh, to achieve a majority and to form the government. Now, the losing parties are not good parties. And when they band together to form government, uh, a lot of things uh, that they do is not beneficial, is not good for their country. The next question we have is, you dealt with several US presidents during your time as prime minister in both terms. Which president, US president was the most understanding to Malaysia's needs in the world? Well, basically, America's policy does not uh, appeal to Malaysia. We would like to continue trading with uh, America because it's a good market, but we do not like their politics. Mm. Their tendency is to drag us into groups that, uh, that confront another group. And, for example, they would like Malaysia to join the their group against China. Mm. But we have big trade with China. We cannot oppose China. So that is the kind of thing that uh, they, they do, which is very uh, detrimental to the interests of Malaysia. It's therefore difficult for us to identify leaders in the U.S. who... Uh, who uh, would be good for Malaysia. And just one final question that was submitted in. If you could go back in time and change one thing or you had one policy or one action that you regret or would go back and change, what would that be and why? Well, uh, one of the important things is that the system of democracy is... Uh, a very good system, is the best system, a political system for a country, but it can be abused. And we find that the idea that anybody can uh, try and become the, the prime minister, for example, uh, divides their attention to working for the country towards working for their self-interest. And we have a lot of people who are not really good uh, administrators, but who saw 
the democratic system as a system that can be used by them for their own um, well, for their own interest. So this is uh, what I am against. I think that not all countries can become democratic. But if you want to be a democratic, have mm. only two parties, not more than two, then you can have one or the other party winning and a government can be formed. We should avoid uh, multi-party uh, mm. uh, democracies because that will split up the people to the point where no one gains a majority. So this is uh, what we would like to see in Malaysia. We would like to see in Malaysia not many parties, but only two parties. Um, and they can contest. One or the other would win. Of course, uh, we have to have good uh, election, not election that are, uh, well, uh, that is open to bribery and corruption. Hmm. Dr. Mahathir, thank you so much for joining us on Talking Foreign Affairs. We really appreciate your insight and your time. You're welcome.